Welcome to the 18th season of the Nitwits, a weekly roundtable discussion on the Penn State Nittany Lions. Our Nitwits panel includes Neil Riddell of the Altoona Mirror, Mark Brennan of FightOnState.com, Jacob Kauker of WTAJ Sports, and a special guest Nitwit each week. The Nitwits are brought to you by Irwin Financial Raymond James, an independent firm and firm foundation for your financial future. Coldwell Banker, no one will work harder to sell your home. By Reed and Cellini, doctors Reed and Cellini provide orthodontics for children and adults. By Fiore True Value on 6th Avenue Altoona, just ask rental. Buy what you want, rent what you need. By Monarch Cleaners, for all your cleaning needs. By your rehab choice, Health South Altoona, ask for us by name. By Courtesy Motors of Altoona, where courtesy means a great deal. By the Allegro, where fine cuisine is a way of life. By EasyToUse.com, your Yellow Pages connection in print and online. By FightOnState.com, as close as you get to Penn State football without putting on a helmet. And by the Altoona Mirror, featuring Penn State Game Day every Friday and Penn State Extra every Sunday. Who says it has to be pretty to be fun? A whirlwind game with eight combined turnovers ends in a one-point Penn State win. We, of course, are the Nitwits. They are Neil Rudell from the Altoona Mirror, Mark Brennan of FightOnState.com, and Penn State football historian Lou Prado. Thanks for being with us, Lou. Thank you. I am, of course, your host, Jacob Calker. Let's air it out like Penn State's offense. Nine passes of 25 yards or more from this team on Saturday. Is that just them being good? Was it Maryland being bad? Was it a mixture of both? Well, uh, James Franklin said afterwards uh, that he was kind of surprised Maryland didn't, uh, they just chose to play that way and Penn State continued to attack. I think some of these teams decide they're not going to let Penn State beat them by the run and so they forced Christian Hackenberg uh, to go deep and he gave his receivers a lot of chances to go up and win jump balls and his receivers had a tremendous day and I mean, Christian averaged 24 <laughs> yards uh, per reception to Wes Lewis. It may be a single game record for Yeah, uh, yeah he was over 10 yards per, uh, per attempt for Penn State. They had, obviously, uh, Geno Lewis attempted a pass, too, that probably should have been caught. But listen, you know, I've, the, when I've had complaints about the Penn State offense, it's that they've not really adjusted. And here they did. I got more zero coverage and more that sort of thing uh, than I think they expected. So they came out and started attacking it. And you know what? It wasn't just that they were going deep. They were doing it to different players. You see Godwin obviously doing things. Deshaun Hamilton, uh, Saeed Blacknell, Geno Lewis gets back into it. So to see Christian Hackenberg spread it around to all those different guys, uh, th that to me, you know, this to me was one of John Donovan's better games. And those receivers really fought for the ball. I yep. mean, there was a lot of hand fighting going on there. I mean, the officials kept it pretty good. I mean, there was, but I mean, they were fighting, and that's what I like best. And, but I want to ask you guys, because I'm not into this necessarily as deep as you, but. Uh, when they're double teamed or when the zone, they, we, we've complained before about not finding separation. Uh, do you think this might now lead them to better separation when they get double teamed and uh, they trust Hackenberg and he trusts them a little bit more? Well, I think the other thing that may do, Lou, is that it may force teams to not go as much single coverage. So, you know, when they double team them with Barkley, that's taken a safety out of the mix there, and it's going to allow him to do something. So I don't know that these guys are ever going to be fantastic at beating double teams. That's very difficult to do. Only the special of the special, even in the NFL, are really able to do that. But to keep opposing defenses honest, we, they could not do that at all last year. We're starting to see them take some steps toward that. So I think whether it's doing it using the pass to set up the run, and not only in a game, but for, for the rest of the season, or earlier this year when they used the run to set up the pass. I think we're starting to see them do some ch chess moves. And, and think, think if Lynch would have caught that ball the, on that, on the, and if Gusecki starts learning to catch his ball, I mean, he really, I feel sorry for the kid, getting the tight end into the, into the mix a little bit more. You know, what I like, you referenced Donovan, uh, you know, they went in this game, they had a little fun, too. I mean, you know, they put in the, the, the pass that the, the Lewis threw, they split out 
Paris Palmer into the flat. They, they used the Wildcats some. So maybe they're, they're feeling a little bit more comfortable with what they can accomplish. Yes. Yeah, well, I'll go ahead, Jake. Yeah, you saw a lot of different things. And, you know, when you, you talk about not necessarily separation, but winning those jump balls. It seemed like every 50-50 ball that was up in the air, one of those Penn State receivers was coming down with it. And obviously, when you're talking about a one-point game, and you talk about maybe one of those, but if you don't win 100% of those, that's just how important it was. Well, and that's, it's, it speaks to Hackenberg's confidence in the receivers as well. I mean, let's th take a step back for a second. For all the criticism Hackenberg's gotten, if I'm not wrong, he only has two interceptions on the year, and that's allowed him to stay in most games. Obviously, things got away from them at Ohio State and late against Temple, but by and large, they were in those games you know, until the third quarter, and the reason is because they haven't really turned the ball over. Now, we can get into that end of it against the inferior team when they did maybe turn the ball over, but that kind of balance itself out because both teams had those issues. I have to tell you something, Maryland fans were very pleased because the new coach, Loxley, there for already opened it up yeah. and they had a great practice. I was listening to, this, to the to the pregame of the of the broadcasters. They're talking about how much fun and nothing to lose and all that stuff. And they played like it. They yeah. made just more errors than we did. Yeah, nothing to lose. You want to talk about the other side of the ball, you know, the, the way that they ran their offense. They just, I mean, they were just going to go out there and attack it and, and just see what happened. And Penn State has struggled against running quarterbacks now. It always seems like every time they play one, the defense, though, just coming up with just one or two more big plays than Maryland. Sloppy you know? tackling. Yeah. yeah, the tackling wasn't good, and they've not set the edge all that well, particularly these last couple of weeks. But when the game was on the line, their defense was fresh. Uh, they forced uh, three fourth quarter turnovers. They stopped Maryland, I think, to just one first down on Maryland's last three possessions. So the defense finished the game even stronger than Penn State's offense did. Jake, you remember a couple weeks ago at, at practice, I asked, uh, or, uh, yeah, I asked Franklin. It would have been interesting if I asked O'Brien. I asked Franklin <laughs> how they prepare for Ohio State with two different kinds of quarterbacks, and he said it, in Tommy Stevens, their true freshman, he's a mobile guy, but he also can throw the ball. Well, he's not nearly as mobile, and I really wonder, I think it would be interesting to find out if they actually ever try to throw a running back in there or somebody. They used to do that, and that's why we referenced O'Brien. I know they did it a couple times with him where they would throw a running back or a receiver as a Wildcat-type quarterback in practice on the foreign team, you wonder how many good looks they're getting at these yeah. kind of guys in practice it, it because clearly Penn State has the athletes on defense to stop it. Just, it just seemed in the fourth quarter was different than the first three quarters and they, they must they come up with something because the linebackers were making some tackles and the linemen were making tackles. So it was more than more than a sloppy tackle. And the yeah. holes were just there and the guy just went on. Oh, some of the defensive players after the game were talking about just how deceiving kind of that mesh point can be you know when, when it's whether it's army with that triple option or, or maryland did it as well where you know hills really hid the ball well and just that that extra half step you know they said that it's not that they didn't know it was coming it's just still just so hard to deal with when you're out there on the field that that was one of the things that a couple of different guys talked about after the game you know we talked about uh, you know when they took the lead they had some of the backups uh that allowed nice. maryland to rush up the field but uh, as Zettel said, you know, those guys were back in there to finish the game and finish it strong. So I got to give Shoup credit. He also had a real timely blitz with Brandon Bell. All right. Well, after all of that, I think we need a breather because we really got into this Maryland game. When we return on the Nitwits, it's a record setting day for number 14. We will reflect as Hack becomes Penn State's all time leading passer, plus the latest on the juniors draft stop. The Nitwits are brought to you by Irwin Financial Raymond James, an independent firm and firm foundation for your financial future. Coldwell Banker, no one will work harder to sell your home. By Drs. Reed and Selaney, orthodontics for children and adults. By Fiore True Value on 6th Avenue Altoona, just ask rental. Buy what you want, rent what you need. I'm Miles Davenbach from your Penn State Nittany Lions, and you're watching the Nitwits.
Well, it's a good week to have Penn State football historian Lou Prado with us because Christian Hackenberg makes some history. The junior finishes the game against Maryland with a new record, 7,453 career passing yards. He's also the new career completions leader with 608. Lou, as you're starting to look at his legacy kind of rounding into shape, what are you seeing? I think we're going to have to wait till the year finishes and see what happens. I mean, it, it, you know, there's a lot of criticism about him now, and I'm a, I'm a Hackenberg guy. His legacy is going to be one thing. There's no one that did what he did to stay here. I mean, he had a great freshman year. Remember, Zach, Zach Mills had a great freshman year, and he got hurt. And, 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 this, and, and it's just, you just see on the field, he's, he's not the same player, whatever the reason. But he still comes up with big games. And as Mark Hurst said earlier, only two interceptions all year. And, you know, he, he, he fumbled the ball. I mean, what? at that one point, it, how did, I, I don't think he's getting the right coaching. I don't know what, you know, I don't know if, I'm not going to say who's at fault, but there's something, there's something wrong with him. But as a, as a man, fine. But as a quarterback, you got to remember, quarterbacks have been criticized at Penn State. You know, two of the best quarterbacks were Kerry Collins and, and uh, Bill Plum. And they, they went through criticism, you know, and I went through the, through, uh, the Schaefer years and, the, and even go back to, to, uh, to Chuck Burkhardt and, on, on Joe's teams. I mean, it's, it's quarterbacks, you know, at every, every school, but at this particular school, because we're not known for producing mm -hmm. quarterbacks. But as far as legacy, he's going to be one, number one in many, in many books for his faithfulness to Penn State because he could have left. And that would have had such a ripple effect that set the program back. Um, you know, I think that you know, he's done it a lot. Um, th these records are a little deceiving. Evan Royster is the all-time leading rusher, and I don't know that that means he's the greatest running back they've ever had. Uh, Christian has done it in many fewer games. We'll see how his ultimate le legacy plays out as a, a potential professional c candidate. At Penn State right now, I think he, he clearly, no matter what his numbers are going to end up being, to me, you know, Kerry Collins, it's where it starts. He led you to a national title. You have Blackledge, um, and you had some other uh, very efficient quarterbacks. Uh, Michael Robinson would be in the discussion Chuck as far as what he meant. Yeah, uh, but I, I don't think he's quite there yet. And the leveling off, I mean, he played very well yesterday, gave his receivers a chance, but this short passing game has just really taken a step backwards this year. Yeah, and I would agree with that. The one thing I would add, though, is that, you know, Lou, let's not forget that not only did he not leave, he came. I mean, he oh, could he oh. could have not, he, he committed, and then he, he, he came. He could have gone to Alabama. Right, he came after the sanctions hit. There was nothing, he did not, that was not a binding verbal commitment. You know, after everything you hit the fan, he and Brenneman are two guys who stuck with the program. Jasicki, a lot of the, not just Jasicki was the following year, uh, but a lot of those guys, man, uh, you know, a lot of those kids stuck, stuck with the program. So when you talk about legacies, it's almost like when you talk about Michael Motti. I don't think he's ever going to be remembered as the greatest linebacker, but as good as he was, but he had such a huge impact on this program. To me, Christian Hackenberg, the same type of thing. Very good player, could ultimately be a great player, whether it's this level or the next level. Haven't seen it quite yet, but a great legacy player, great things at Penn State for what he did sticking and with the program. And as you say, Monty, he's one of the great leaders of all time. Yeah. Right. And Christian's been too. I mean, that's after the, the after the after some of the blowback he got last year. And let's face it, he was a true sophomore. They made him a captain. Had to be a very difficult thing. He admitted he didn't handle things well. He has been a terrific leader this year. You saw in the second half of that game, he was in there, you know, rallying the troops, stopping in the defensive huddle. These are the things that when, no matter how much this kid struggles or how much he plays well, I'm always going to think back, always said the right thing, always showed up after tough losses and wins. So, I, you know, I like him too. And think how many hits he's taken yeah, wow. and, 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 and his draft stock has kind of taken a hit as well he's kind of dropping down Mel Kuyper I think now has him as the sixth best quarterback on the board which obviously those projections are simply that it's speculation but you kind of hit on the short pass game what other areas maybe are you looking at where he could improve that again and maybe bounce back up I would get, I mean, and I don't know that I'm qualified. You know, when these pro people start looking at, at his tapes, they're going to be able to see the, you know, these check downs and hot reads and all this terminology that they use. I, I don't know that I, I think the accuracy has to be better than what he has been, but maybe at the next level, he's so smart. And uh, I think when he gets into these camps and these combines, right. you're going to forget a lot about, 
or they're going to forget a lot about uh, some of the struggles that he might have had against Buffalo. And listen, as much as we might want to be critical of any uh, you know, draft analysts, a lot of times these guys are very good at what they do, and they're getting their information from somewhere. It's not just them. They're talking to pro talent evaluators, that sort of thing. But, Neil, great point. No matter what happens this season, if he decides to go, whether it's this year or whether he plays another year, he is going to have so much time to prove himself working out and at combines and everything else. And That's not going to be. Re remember what he did last year in that opening game at Ironman, mm -hmm. what he did in the last game at the Pinnacle, and what he did in Ohio State. That's the, the Hackenberg that I'm going to remember no matter yeah, what. Yeah, you could put together some great highlight right. tape of him mm -hmm. with comebacks and poison, but there's also, there's also the other side of some really bad passes that he's thrown for whatever reason, and uh, hopefully he'll get that corrected uh, in November here. All right, well, it is time to move forward. Penn State's long been known as the Beast of the East. We'll go inside some of these regional rivalries. As they seem to heat up again uh, on and off the field, plus... The new treat Penn State football historian Luke Prado has for you Nittany Lion fans. The Nitwits are brought to you by by Monarch Cleaners for all your cleaning needs. By your rehab choice, Health South Altoona. Ask for us by name. By Courtesy Motors of Altoona, where courtesy means a great deal by the Allegro, where fine cuisine is a way of life. Now back to the nitwits. A roundtable discussion of Penn State football. Well, our special guest this week is Penn State football historian Lou Prado. He's got a new book out. It's called 100 Things Penn State Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. Not sure We'll have time for all 100 on this episode, <laughs> but how do you come up with this list or, or group of, of 100 things that Penn State fans Well, you first you start thinking of what, how you're going to do it, and I did it in a historical perspective. If Mark wrote it or Neil wrote it, they'd do it a little differently, and I understand that. So I'd done a lot of research on this, you know, I, and I stumbled into this because I'm an old broken down sports writer like these guys. You know, I, that, I just lived longer than that, but and I, I got the book done before, 100, before I died too, so that's what's good. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about the rivalries here, and, and rivalries in the book, and, and I mentioned the fact, I mean, I, I, I play off this every week to publicity in this Maryland game, you know, the 19, they wore the throwback mm -hmm. uniforms in 1961, and, and I was with my Maryland friends, my Maryland cousin, and, and on tailgating with the Terps, and I said, you know, this may be the, the curse of the throwback jerseys, you may start beating us. Well, after the game, I said, no, it's the curse of the 1961 team, because they were the first, Maryland was the first team to put names on jerseys, and I mentioned that in the book, but they lost. And they won that game, and they haven't. They, they only won one game since. And what happened that one game they lost? They beat us last year. We didn't have. We had names on jerseys, so there's something about. <laughs> so, so this would be the code of the Bill, the, coast, uh, the curse of the Billy Goat uh, Tavern, you know, in Chicago. But, but uh, I talk about the Pitts series in there because mm -hmm. if we're talking about this, we're talking about a rival. Will Maryland be a be a rival? A rivalry has to be both sides. Mm -hmm. My point, I think our biggest rival in the last 10 years or 20 years, maybe 25, has been Nebraska. You know, because of, of the way that way that's happened nationally before we even when they went into the Big Ten. But we need a rival close by. If we can't get Pitt into the Big Ten and we're not going to the ACC, then let's get Maryland before before Rutgers. I mean, of all of all to me, I, I'd love to have Maryland, and and it's just too bad. But they got to win some games, okay? You just even if you had two or three in a row, unless there's some meanness that's, that comes out. Then, then you get a rivalry going, but right. we just don't have a natural rivalry. It's not the uh, rivalry until the other guy wins. And, but I, I, I think that ship sailed, unfortunately, with Pitt. Um, you know, some of the older fans, including me, have, have always appreciated that series, and we'll see what these four games bring. But I thought it was really cool to play an Eastern team. There were a lot of Penn State flavor in Baltimore, and I think you felt a, a good buzz in the stadium. Um, and, and Maryland, I think, played harder than they have. Yeah, I've always been to the opinion that I don't think the Pitt series would be a great thing for Penn State. I think that would do more for Pitt than it would for Penn State. But I just want to throw that out there to counterbalance Neil's no, Western right. PA. But I with what you're saying about playing some of these games in the local cities like I like that they're playing in Pittsburgh in the next couple of years I like that they went down to Baltimore I had a chance to go down to Baltimore a couple of days early my daughter at school off you know we're down there a ton of Penn State mm -hmm. fans just enjoying themselves and the other thing that was cool about that game after all the garbage last year 
I thought the players were very classy from both sides afterward. And I think you started to see, okay, last year everybody wanted to kind of puff out their chest. These, a lot of these guys know each other, and I think it was like, hey, this is a great game. We had fun playing. And, and that's part of the fun of it, too, is that a lot of these guys, listen, when you're playing Nebraska, how many, how many times is Penn State recruiting against right. Nebraska over right. somebody? Whereas Maryland, man, or Rutgers, you know, maybe Penn State's winning a lot of these battles, but a lot of these kids played against each other. So I like that end of it, having these, the Rutgers and the Marylands from that perspective. And, uh, you know, and you see these last two Maryland games, they've, they've been split. They've been one-point games. If you would continue something like that, that would – make that organic process. Now, of course, that that's dependent on, you know, future results, but you, you mentioned chefs puffing as well. Pat Narduzzi, some people reading into his comments saying that maybe it's a, a, a slap at John Donovan or James Franklin or Christian Hackenberg or, or, or whatever, or, or, or all of them. What do you mean, maybe? <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you make of, of when guys like that, and you know, James Franklin said he doesn't read too much because he said some things that people have read things into. He and said dominate the states, so Narduzzi is just getting back, and that's fine if it creates a little bit of rivalry. But, but you know, the, the people west of, of, of uh, Altoona, they want the rivalry. Mm -hmm. People east of it, they really don't. They'd, w they'd rather have Notre Dame or play Alabama every year or one, you know, and, and spread it out. And I think that's the problem that, that Sandy Barber has in, in, the, in the scheduling in the future. You know, Michigan State, they tried to do a, do a, do a rival, uh, <laughs> a big rival with us, the mm -hmm. Land Grant Trophy. You know, we've talked about that many The heaviest times. trophy in sports. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You know, and it just didn't work because it's, cause it's not going to work. But we need a rival, but, you know, let's just go and beat every team and, you know, do what we have to do and make them all mad and maybe they'll, they'll all want to rival beat us. You know, Narduzzi's kind of feeling his oats right now. Pitt's had right. some good wins and he probably figures, hey, well, he'll lob a grenade and it'll get a little buzz in Pittsburgh. You know, there's the Steelers, the Steelers, the Steelers, then the Pirates and the Penguins. So Pitt needs to State, do that. Then, then. Um, but I, so I didn't really take uh, big offense to it. Although you don't see uh, usually a shot at a coach, an assistant coach. All right. Well, Lou mentioned wanting to beat every team. Next up for Penn State, not exactly a rival, but Illinois. They're in the conference. It was for one year or two years. Will <laughs> they be beaten by the Nittany Lions? Our picks when we return. The Nitwits are brought to you by EasyToUse.com, your Yellow Pages connection in print and online. By FightOnState.com, as close as you get to Penn State football without putting on a helmet. And by the Altoona Mirror, featuring Penn State game day every Friday. Another week, another interim coach as Illinois comes to town to play Penn State. Our picks, starting with our picks king so far, Neil Riddell. Thank you, Jake. I look for Penn State's defense to play better uh, this week. Uh, I'm going to say Penn State and the special teams absolutely have to play better. I mean, take that as a challenge. 23-10 uh, Penn State. You know, uh, I think this is going to be a defensive struggle. Illinois actually has played some good defense this year. You know, I'm so far out of this, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Penn State 11, Illinois 5. Ooh, that's very Illinois. Uh, we're going to a bowl game. We're 6-2. and two. We could be 7-2 and you know, two next week. And I've looked about Illinois. I've looked up, and I'm going, as Mark knows, I don't like to predict 31-14. to 14. 31 to 14 wow, as I do the nice. math. I will Come on, go. Jake, hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh, Penn <laughs> State, I think, gets the win. I, I like where the offense has been going. I think they keep it up a little bit. I'm going to go Penn State 24, Illinois 10. Hopefully, I haven't totally done myself in here. And speaking of done in, that's what, wow. what we all are because Neil, with his win, this last week has secured no less than a tie. So Un unprecedented from from the reigning <laughs> nitwit of the year to this upcoming okay. nitwit of the year. Congratulations. Thank you, Jake. All right. Well, that'll do it for the nitwits. We will see you next week. The nitwits are brought to you by Irwin Financial, Raymond James an independent firm and firm foundation for your financial future. Coldwell Banker, no one will work harder to sell your home. By Reed and Selaney, doctors Reed and Selaney provide orthodontics for children and adults. By Fiore True Value on 6th Avenue Altoona, just ask rental. Buy what you want, rent what you need. By Monarch Cleaners, for all your cleaning needs. By your rehab choice, 
Health South Altoona. Ask for us by name. By Courtesy Motors of Altoona, where courtesy means a great deal. By the Allegro, where fine cuisine is a way of life. By EasyToUse.com, your Yellow Pages connection in print and online. By FightOnState.com, as close as you get to Penn State football without putting on a helmet. And by the Altoona Mirror, featuring Penn State Game Day every Friday and Penn State Extra every Sunday. You can also see the nitwits on AltoonaMirror.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next week.